right, everybody. So today, back on the podcast, we have a roundtable with Paris Butler, also known as Bald Omni Man, and Landon of Basement Bodybuilding. How are you doing, guys? Doing good. How are you doing, man? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, so I've had each of you guys individually, right? But I've not had you guys as a roundtable. And it, there's kind of like this whole space that you two have, have really blown up in the last, I'd say, year or two, maybe. Um, we had Alex Leonidas as like one of the original guys in the space and Jeffrey Verdi Schofield more recently, natural hypertrophy. And, and so a lot of people have recommended getting you guys back on and, and having, you know, another discussion. And what I mentioned to you guys was that I thought it would be a good episode to really talk about what we find to be ideal programming, because a lot of time, I mean, we'll talk more about that and, and other things, of course, but, um, you know, a lot of the topics we talk about, like, you know, um, the genetics of lifting and like how far is natural potential and things like that. And that's, that's all great. But with that said, I don't want to ignore some of these little details that can refine, you know, like maybe those last five to 10% of somebody's gains. Um, and, and like, there is, even though a lot of studies do show, Hey, like, you know, a lot of the stuff comes out to be the same as long as volume is equated. I think there are better and worse ways to train. I don't want to ignore that. So I really want to dive into that with you guys today. Sure. That's, that's interesting. You bring that up because I know, especially in our space, my way of training, like my split, I don't think anyone else trains the way that I do. I train full body like five times a week, mm. but, they're, but they're not short sessions. Like I know Jeff Nipper did that in the past, but mine are pretty like media. So I do a lot of volume each session. So I became to shed some more light on why I do that and how it's working for me. Cool. Cool. So, uh, so yeah, we're going to dive into all that. Also, this is a, a rare thing on this channel that I am clean shaven. So everybody's seeing my baby face. So you guys can tell me how much I de-aged if I, I did it all with this. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of it, to be honest, uh, especially like with patients who think I'm like 12 if I fully shave, but, uh, but I kind of just wanted to see what it would look like. Uh, I think I'll be going back to the beard though, for sure. So you mentioned, um, Paris, that you you do full body five days a week, and we'll, we'll dive into the details. Landon, right now, how are you training? So I'm basically trying to maximize an upper lower split in terms of volume, and I'm slowly working my way up to higher volume and higher exercise selection in an upper lower, I'm doing five times a week, so three upper, two lower right now, and just started, I don't want to say from scratch, because I've been lifting for a while at this point, but one lift per muscle group, and then just kind of playing around with the volume on that, maximizing that, <clears throat> excuse me. And then once I kind of maximize each lift, introducing another in a small dose and slowly building that up. So uh, I'm just trying to see where I can push myself in terms of the upper lower split. Cause of course I'm being a little more liberal with the uh, frequency, especially for upper. I just want to see how far I can push the volume and exercise selection within that split. Okay. Um, and both of you guys are currently trying to gain, like you're, are you massing phases in a surplus or? Yeah. Um, I'm definitely in a, in a bulk and I, I see myself bulking. It's been 20 months now. I'm still like beach lean. I'm not as lean as I was when I started. So I don't see any reason to stop for at least another six months to a year, honestly. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think, good context for people because I do think when you're dieting, you know, obviously, again, there are better and worse ways to do things. But I think for the most part, you're really trying, I mean, unless you're really early in the game, you're trying to hold on to everything that you had. And, and I do, I think some of these specifics might be a little less important. I think you have to allocate more for recovery. Um, but I but I think a lot of like the programming details to push past where you've been come in when you're in a surplus, you know? Absolutely. Cool. So, so let's start with you, Paris, like in terms of like, yours is a little bit unique. I haven't done full body more than th even three times a week in a long time. So why did you stumble on something that's so different? Is it that you, you tried many things and this is just what you found worked or is it something that, you know, I don't know, go into the details there. Well, there's a, a bunch of different reasons. So first and foremost, I just think full body training is interesting. I always like the idea of just training your full body and your full body recovering all at the same time just made a lot more sense to me in that way how i stumbled into it though is also interesting because it really started with just adding you know odds and ends isolations to like lower body days so like lateral raises and things like that and i found myself adding more and more to the lower body days especially just because they were just like some squats some hinges and maybe an isolation or two 
Mm. I'm like, if I'm going to do this, how would a full blown, full body training plan work for me? So it started with just one full body session and that turned into two and then that turned into three. And then from there, it's actually five days within like a 10 to 12 day asynchronous split. So I give myself at least a day of rest in between each session okay. and it'll take anywhere between like 10 and like I said, 12 days, depending on how much rest I need. Gotcha. To finish all five of them. So and they're all high volume too. Okay. So, so it's not quite, so I was thinking it was like five days a week you were doing full body, but you're saying it's five different full body workouts done over maybe 12 days. Yeah. And that'll work out to, it, it'll still work out to like four full body sessions in a seven day period. Right. Before. Right. And there's always one day in between you said. At least one day. Sometimes I take two if I didn't, for whatever reason, couldn't sleep well that night and I didn't recover. Yeah. Okay. So then it, really then you're probably looking on average three to four days per week, right? Um, like if somebody was going every other day, then it would be three days, one week, four days the next, et cetera, like an AV. Um, and, and then with five different workouts, that's quite a bit, right? Is that just so that you can fit in maximized exercise selection and variability? Absolutely. So what I found, especially transitioning from strength training to what I have been doing the past year, year and some change, bodybuilding training, it isn't so much hitting a frequency. So like on a strength training for program, for example, you'll make sure that you're doing bench a certain time amount of times per week or deadlift or whatever. I don't so much care about that so much as am I hitting every function of the muscles that I want to hit? So to, to be able to do that the way that I want to, the five sessions really is necessary for me because, and I posted my personal program on Patreon a while back and I'll share it with you guys if you're curious, but you go into it, you'll see that like, there's some commonality between movement patterns, of course, because you still have to make sure that like you're hitting a horizontal press a certain amount of times to grow your chest and things like that. But the types of horizontal presses are different in that they're working different functions of like the shoulders, the pecs. They may have different biases. It's really just all some a gigabrain concoction, I like to say, of like exercises that really work. It's a really good holistic program for me. And it's a lot of fun in that regard, too, because it's a lot of different exercises. I'm never bored. But there's continuity as well because everything flows into one another. Sure. And I'm okay. always changing it, too. Like, I'm always refining it a little bit over time as well. Gotcha. And, and Landon, when you look at the principles there, would you say a lot of that applies in terms of, like, trying to maximize exercise variability? Or are you more just focused on progression on a few key lifts? Yeah, so I actually have... I have a decent amount of variety since I still have that higher frequency. I think when you when you look at if you were to compare my split to Paris's, I think if you take the the principles of that frequency, we're actually pretty much on the same page. I just like to separate upper from lower. Um, I don't know how he can be so strong and handle those full body sessions. That stuff kicks my ass. So mm. I do like to separate my lowers, <clears throat> keep them fresh on their own day. So um, yeah, I think with the frequency of the exercise selection and variety, I've definitely got a, a decent amount of variety, especially now that I'm introducing new lifts. So I was just, I actually made a couple of changes to my program yesterday because I did end up getting a, a membership at a, a gym kind of close by. So I'm going to do a couple of days over there and a couple of days in the home gym. So that gives me a lot more variety. And I think yeah. just from, uh, a, a training enjoyment slash lift ADHD mindset. It's nice to have a bit of variety too, to keep things fresh. But at the same time, of course, you have to have, like Paris was saying, some type of overlap in the, in the movement patterns to keep them close enough to where you can still progress, of course. Yep. Yeah. I think that is one thing that's interesting is if, if you look at like even 10 or so like 20 years ago, there was a lot of push with power building and like, you know, just the big three. And if you, you know, if you just get strong with these, that's going to be enough. And and I still do stand by the fact that like, obviously if, if you get to, you know, 315 for reps on bench press and, you know, maybe like, I don't know, 45 to 90 pounds attached to you for pull-ups and like, you know, 225 for rows and all whatever, you know, benchmarks you have, that's going to build a great base for a lot of people. But it does seem like the people who really are 
focus on bodybuilding more so it comes back to a decent amount of variability and exercise selection right and it's not necessarily just these core lifts one because the core lifts don't always work for everybody um and then two even if they do work for people it seems like there's still some benefit to the variability and a lot of people kind of come back to that it seems yeah so i think a lot of it comes down to technique as well i think a lot of the time we tend to overlook techni technique and i did for a long time too before i got strong so i would see a lift and i'd see you always correlate size and strength because of course there's a correlation there and that's with that whole power building phase five ten years ago whatever it was that was a, a popular thing to hear so my younger self would say all right well if i get a 600 deadlift or i can bench this much then I'll, I'll be big and there's no way around it. And of course I got bigger, but there's no way that I was maximizing hypertrophy because yeah, like on paper, I was that strong, but at the same time I wasn't controlling my eccentrics. And I think that's a huge part of getting stimulus out of a lift. I was cutting range of motion where I could. And these are, these are pretty simple things looking back. But I think if you, if you get strong on a lift that produces good hypertrophy, something that gives you good range of motion, a nice weighted stretch, a nice controlled tempo that you can safely take closer to muscular failure, which we're realizing more and more about uh, the importance of that moving forwards. I think, uh, I think there's really no way around it. But then even then, if you were to dive a little bit deeper into the mindset of progressing on these lifts, at the end of the day, you're not really chasing strength, you're chasing stimulus and the strength will come naturally from that. So like, a, a big misconception about my training when I started is I started off training purely for hypertrophy, knew nothing about powerlifting or power building. And I had some of the best new gains that I've really ever seen, not to put myself on a pedestal, but I think I was just, I listened to the right people and I got things right. And I, I think that focusing on the hypertrophy principles will get all those beginners that struggle getting stronger or struggle getting bigger. I think if you really just pack on muscle and train properly and nail your technique, the strength will come and you can kind of get the ball rolling and build some momentum that way. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Um, do you think, and it's interesting, like you said about how, you know, we use the uh, chase strength and then now it kind of seems like almost like that's just the, the outcome from chasing the stimulus and that notion, I think it's hard to distinguish between the two, but that, seem to have come up in recent years it was always like progressive overload progressive overload you get stronger that makes you grow and i think it's hard to separate out the two of like kind of what comes first but it does kind of seem like yeah like you get stronger because you grew right um and and like they they tend to go in tandem but um i do think when you think about it differently like that then it's easier to kind of hold yourself back from maybe like bad form and bad reps because i know for me with my training, it was always like, well, I have to progress each workout. And like, as if like that is necessarily the stimulus that's going to lead to growth, but then that could lead to like ego lifting, like, oh, I'm quote unquote stronger this because I move more weight. Whereas I think if you just have the mindset of like, I'm trying to create the stimulus that will lead to the growth and the strength, it probably becomes a little mentally easier to hold yourself back from ego lifting. You know what I mean? Agreed. And I think there's there's people that have different mental environments that each advice is going to work differently for. So I think when when you look at the conversation, let's say it is a chicken and egg scenario where you're not sure if, hey, well, if I can increase 1%, my body can't really detect that. It's not going to break down my technique, but it can artificially, not artificially, I don't know why I use that word, but it can give me a little bit of extra stimulus because it's still manageable for me and that will cause me to adapt to a higher load. Whether it's that where those micro progressions do make you adapt to it or whether it's the other way around where you got really good stimulus from a weight that you can master for reps and technique that you can master and now you're better at that. So you have to add weight to match to just to match the same stimulus. Uh, I think it could be either way, but personally, I think the the mindset that I prefer is to say, all right, well, I get adaptations from chasing stimulus and the progression is just something I have to do to match that stimulus. Because if I'm benching 225 for 10, if I have a great session of benching 225 for 10 and I adapt to it, now maybe I can get 225 for 11. So doing 225 for 10 is less potent. And now that I'm getting less out of that, maybe after two weeks, I can do 225 for 12. And now that 10 isn't doing a whole ton for me. So I think at that point, you have to just 
work your way up to match stimulus. And another thought on that is if if heavier weights are more stimulative, then why do gains slow down in a linear fashion typically? And that's that's just another thing that I kind of think about that comes with that chicken and egg philosophy, I guess. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Paris, would you, would you say that when you are lifting these days, you are still trying to, I mean, obviously we're still trying to progress as much as possible, but I'm saying how much of an emphasis do you place on the technique and form versus just heavier loads? I think... So I like to break it down Barney style. And that's like a, a military phrase to say that I like to take something that's complicated and make it as simple for me as possible so that I can just execute. So I turn it into a process. I don't remove or divorce technique from progression. So I talk about this all the time on my videos wherein we have a minimum standard of form that we adhere to. It's conducive to the goals that we have. So for me, it's hypertrophy. So it's a control eccentric. Nice pause when applicable and making sure that we're getting a good stimulus for what we're doing. And that'll look like a spectrum. So there's too much good form, quote unquote, and then there's too sloppy form. And we'll want to be somewhere in the middle. So I make sure that I'm somewhere in the middle all the time. I don't divorce that from adding reps and adding sets or reducing rest. It's kind of all part of the same natural sequence that ends with adding weight. So if I'm ensuring I have good form. I can add reps and I can add sets. And those three are all married with one another. Once I reach a certain threshold, I can add weight. And I kind of marry that in like a regular standard double or dynamic double progression. And that's more so than how I've consistently every workout for the past 20 months progressed on something. Oftentimes, most things of my training program. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, and just for people listening, you know, can you guys give a context of roughly how many sets per week you're doing per body part? Mm. I'll let Landon yeah, go first. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at about some are as low as five, uh, some are as high as 16. I think that's the highest uh -huh. I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. Most things are 10 to 10 to 15 is kind of the sweet spot for me right now, which is actually slightly higher than I was just recently doing. Okay. Um, and then, I, I mean, for you, Paris, since you said you don't know off the top of your head, does each full body workout have a similar number per body part or some days more like back heavy and some days are more like pressing heavy? Absolutely. So some of them will be emphasized on certain things. So some may have more pressing. Some may have more legs. I know on the session that I just did a couple of days ago, there's four sets of like deep leg presses, like the Dr. Mike style leg presses, mm -hmm. and three sets of heel elevated squats, and then some pressing, and then a bunch of triceps and arms. So I really more so think about it as, am I filling slots on my training program? And does the number of sets that I'm performing, does it allow me to progress? And then I add more if I feel like I need more. So like, like I said, I don't know off the top of my head, I guess on that session, I do seven quad or squat motion sets. In general, I like to think of it as, so if I have like an arm biased session, for example, I may go lighter on the compounds in terms of how many I do or how many sets I do. But then I'll make sure that I do like four sets of extensions, four sets of press downs, four sets of like stretch based curls, and then four sets of pronated curls. So I guess it'd be eight and eight on a session like that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Paris, but it sounds like you are breaking yours down more of like you looking at, okay, what specific movement patterns do I need? And I'm just going to make sure that I get a sufficient number of sets of that rather than just saying like, okay back and there's got to be 20 sets of back per week it seems like you're kind of breaking it down to like i want a specific you know movement pattern here and movement pattern here that's adequately stimulated absolutely and i look at it in the capacity of am i able to follow like my double or dynamic double progression or add reps if i'm able to do that consistently there is no reason for me to have more volume and it's just been a natural consequence of progressing in my training that I do more volume as opposed to uh, I have to do these many sets or I'm not going to grow. And that's more so when I work with people that I, that I coach, that's how I get them. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but 
that's how I try to get them to look at it so they don't have a fear of missing out when it comes to like, you know, not feeling like they're doing the optimal number of sets or reps or what have you. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the clients and I do want to get into that, but I just think, I just want to comment one more time that it is interesting because, you know, you get so many people who, and, and, you know, I kind of started off the conversation by saying that I do think the details matter. Um, but within that, a lot of that self-experimentation, because when you get to the, like, if you look at like even Mr. Olympia or even from like a natural, like, you know, the top naturals and everything, there's so much variability in what they found works for them. So I don't think it's necessarily key, but I recall one guy who's well-known saying years ago, like, if you don't know your volume load, right, which is sets times reps times the load, then you don't know anything about programming, which was like, even at the time, it was such a ridiculous thing to say. And this was when volume load was really popular. And it was just so ridiculous because it's like, look, man, there's so many different ways to track these things. Some people do just do number of sets per body part per week. Some people do volume load. Some people do like moving patterns like you're doing Paris. And I think as long as you relative to your own training have a way to gauge that, it's probably fine. But I do like the idea of making sure that you're hitting those moving patterns because it could be very easy to say, well, okay, I do 12 sets of triceps per week. And somebody does 12 sets of different pushdowns per week, right? Versus saying like, okay, well, maybe you want to have something that's like overhead, right? To get more of the long head, uh, maybe, or even like with hamstring movements, right? Maybe you want to have some sort of like uh, hip extension, right? And maybe you want to have some sort of like leg curl or something in there as well, uh, versus just like a certain number of sets per body part, which is, it can be a little overly generic. So I, I like that you kind of address that. Absolutely. I, I appreciate you acknowledging that. I, I feel that philosophy is a, a marriage of my background in strength training. And I took the best parts of that, which is movement mastery. That's ultimately what strength training is, is mastery of a few movements. And taking the, the, the spirit of that and applying it to what would be bodybuilding or hypertrophy training. Not looking to do a million different movements just because but doing enough of a movement to get better at that movement. That's like the soul of strength training. And I've applied that to bodybuilding training the, the best way that I could. And I found great results with it. Um, awesome. I was already, I would say, advanced as a strength training, you know, trainee. But I've made very rapid gains in a hypertrophy contest because of, I, in my opinion, having that prior background in strength training. And not necessarily because of the strength, but because of the, the the ability to know myself and know what I need and apply, like I said, the strengths of that to my hypertrophy training. And I've learned a lot as well, I feel. Sure, sure. Any additional comments on that aspect, Landon? Um, no, I think I think you guys made a great point about the what to pick first, the exercise selection or the volume. And I think especially a few years back when we were so uh, obsessed with volume being the the lead cause of growth and everything, I think a lot of people were were trying to do whatever they could to match that somewhat arbitrary set total. But I think you have to look at it like, all right, well, if you're just doing X lift that is highly potent and requires a ton of recovery, why are you going to try and just arbitrarily get yourself up to that set count rather than do what you need to do to get better at that lift, which I think is a great point Paris made. And that's something that as you put in your years of lifting, you start to realize, aha, like this is a potent lift. I don't need five sets just because I have to hit 20 sets per week or something like that. Totally. Cool. So um, now you guys both train clients. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. And then obviously you have your YouTube channels and Instagrams and everything. So when it comes to your clients, I, I don't know how you guys do it. I would say for the most part, you know, I, I have like a deep, very detailed questionnaire. Um, I try to find out about their training history, but there's general, there's certainly general guidelines that I follow to start somebody off. And then it's a lot of modifications along the way, right? It's not like I'm going to pretend I have a hundred different routines. I put people on it. It's like, here's like a general baseline. And then I personally like to gauge how I'm going to like, like week to week, see how they are responding to it. Do you guys do something similar to yourselves with clients or is it a completely different approach with every single person? I can, uh, I can answer that. So, oh, sorry, you can go ahead and go first. I don't want to cut you off. All right. Yeah. I appreciate it. So yeah, I'd say it's, pr it's pretty similar to what you do. I think I, I do a questionnaire just to get mostly info about how, um, 
how that person wants to have their program designed and what's going to work best for them. I think when it comes to training history, uh, a lot of clients might not understand their own training history as much as they think they do. And I think that's, I don't put quite as much stock in the training history because you can hear somebody talk about all of these different things, but at the end of the day, if they don't have the experience of making great progress in the gym, <clears throat> it's a little bit blurry for them too. And that's not the client's fault. That's the the fault of where they're getting their information from and everything. So uh, a big part of it for me is like, it's that first one, two, three months of working with someone where you start to realize, all right, well, you're great at this and this is something that needs to be worked on. So if you can start them off small and just kind of build from the ground up and identify strengths and weaknesses, that's what allows you to grow. So starting off on generally a four day upper lower split with maybe one lift per muscle group um, each day, I find that that's a perfect place to start. And then if like, let's say worst case, you start someone on some massive push pull leg split, but they don't even know how to train close to failure yet. Then you have to kind of tear that down and rebuild from the ground up. So yeah, Paris, you can go. It's interesting that you guys mentioned, uh, the, the training history aspect of it. So I think I'm a little different from y'all in that regard in that I have like my onboarding process and everything is common between that, but I train more intermediate or advanced people or people like stronger than me. And it's a little different in that regard in that I start off with a program that is a little bit different from what I would do because at that point, you're strong enough and big enough to where, you know, your training history does matter. And those, these people are more so coming to me to get like a, a second perspective because whatever, for whatever reason, to just have me make their programming for them, or maybe they're bad with being objective about progressing on their deadlift or pacing it out or whatever. I take a lot more into account their training history because they may not see where something worked really well for them. Or maybe they're not putting enough emphasis on something. So I really put a lot of emphasis on that because that's just more so my client base is people mm -hmm. that are kind of know what they're doing already. For people that are newer, though, that's what I make a lot of my like my self coaching content for. I'm pretty picky as a coach in that regard. If I feel like because coaching is ultimately a luxury service. If you're if you're still asking me questions like is is an incline curl a good bicep exercise or not or is this a good chest exercise or how much volume should I do those aren't self evident questions for everybody which is fine but there's no reason for you to be giving me money for those questions that's just how I've always operated and I'll just direct someone in my my free content and I try to make it as simple to understand so that they can learn. Not so that they could eventually hire me when like they're bigger or more jacked or whatever, but because I just personally don't, not that I don't like working with people that are newer, but I don't feel as though it's always necessary because then, you know, it's just them learning basic things for me that they could learn from me for free off of YouTube. Sure. So, yeah, it's an interesting perspective once you get into the, the training aspect like that, because I, I've had a pretty wide range of clients for people who are literally new to exercising at all uh, to people who are fairly advanced and who have competed and, and things like that. And um, it's obviously completely different working with those two different populations. Um, but I think that both sets can benefit from coaching. I find that for the more advanced people, it, it's more like a soundboard to try to get ideas of like where to go next. Um, and, and obviously for the people who are completely be beginners, just to figure out what to do. I think in, in both cases, though, a lot of coaching just comes down to accountability and somebody to kind of, I don't want to say hold your hand, but keep you going. Um, and, and that doesn't just have to do with like fitness coaching, but just, you know, the people who like business coaching and things like that, where a lot of people know, generally speaking, what to do. Um, and it's just having somebody kind of push them. So uh, do either of you guys feel like that's a big part of your coaching? Do you feel like it's it's just mostly practical advice that they didn't know already? I think it's a combination of both, I would say. I think it, it really just depends on the lifter and their personality and why they come to me. Some people really do need more of like a nuts and bolts and like mentorship approach where like I'm teaching them more things. Mm -hmm. For some people... There are people that I've coached that 
like I said, are just as strong or jacked as me, but they need more so of that accountability piece that you mentioned, or just like, you know, depending upon how smart they are with regards to training, they may overthink certain things. They may change things around a lot. So they come to me to just make things more objective and clear cut. And this is your path to progression. So it really just depends for me, but it's always pretty hands on either way, mm -hmm. different measures. Yeah. And then I think as, as far as like, I guess my clients and my overall coaching philosophy goes, I think a lot of, a lot of people that come to me are generally like early intermediates. And I think they're people that maybe did a few things right, or trained super hard on some like super minimalist program. It just kind of got shortchanged in terms of results. But I think most, most of the people that come to me and by most, I don't mean everybody, but probably a little over half the people that come to me are just like super curious lifters. And they all remind me a lot of myself uh, mm -hmm. when I was newer to training. Uh, and basically my, my philosophy that's kind of evolved with this is I, I can pretty easily tap into who I was a few years ago where I didn't understand training as well. And I was just, you, a lot of the time, I think once you kind of make it to the the bright side of training where you're making good progress and you become more advanced, it's almost easier for someone like me or you guys to almost simplify training as much as we need to, to understand it the best that we can. But once you, before you have those results and before you have the success, it's so easy to second guess yourself. And even if you can understand a certain topic on paper, I think if you don't have that experience of achieving that goal or having that success in training, it's easy to get confused and almost get like program hopping uh, mindsets and stuff like that. So my goal is to just be the person that the younger me wished that I had. Mm -hmm. So I, I answer a lot of questions and I, I enjoy it too. I love talking about training back and forth with my guys. So it's fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Remind me, do you guys... Do you guys both have other jobs outside of the training? So you don't, Landon. This is what you do full-time. Yeah, I, I do it full-time now. Okay. And how about you, Paris? Same here. Same here. Okay. And, and that's something that I, I notice with people who do it full-time versus kind of on the side is I feel like you can really engross yourself in a greater number of clients. Like I, I really only these days take on five, 10 clients at a time um, because I find that I mean, several things happen if I try to take more than that one. Uh, it's just not that enjoyable for me. And at the end of the day, like I'm personally doing this just mostly out of enjoyment. Um, if I wasn't enjoying it, I just would stop doing it. Uh, and secondly, from a client standpoint, I find that people do like to ask a lot of questions, which I really love. I love that people want to understand it. And it's not just like, how do I do this? Um, and I think you just can't fully engage. I mean, you know, not to name anybody specifically, but I know some people who say they have you know, 100 to 200 clients. And it's just very hard for me to imagine how anybody can really give full attention and, and have like coaching calls or anything like that. Uh, if you have that many, and I, like, I don't know how many you guys have, but I assume not, <laughs> not to that extent. Um, well, that's 200 though. Say again? Definitely not 200. No. Definitely not 200. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe they have it set up in a way that's just systematized and, and everything is just kind of like put out there. But uh, I, I just personally find it very hard. And so when you guys say like, you know, you enjoy talking with the clients, I think that comes when you have allocated a proper amount of time. And it's not simply just like, I'm taking on as many clients as possible, which happens when you're either trying to, you know, there's some people who uh, in the fitness industry have had like, they get like one or two years where they're just like really popular. So they take on all these people and then they increase their lifestyle and now they have to maintain that. So then they, they try to take on as many people, even if quality suffers. Um, and, and it seems like you guys are both very much still about like attention to detail. Absolutely. It's all about building quality relationships at the end of the day. with anything that I do. That's why I do it to build a quality relationship with whomever I'm working with. Agreed. Yeah, it was, uh, my, my coaching is something that I've never really promoted, but I had a, I had a link in the about section of my channel and my channel was doing pretty well five, six, seven months ago, I had a lot of upticks back then. So um, I I made sure to to kind of have that long-term vision. And as tempting as it was at the time, when I did have a full-time job working 50 hours a week, as tempting as it was to see my email just flooded with coaching inquiries, which is every coach's dream. Um, with the full-time job, I couldn't manage it. 
I had to put a ton of people on a wait list and I was like, well, I'm only going to take on, I can't take on anybody now because I just took on a few people. I'm building relationships and getting to know these people now. So as much as I'd love from a, a business perspective to take all you guys on now, I, I can't do it. I'm going to have to reach back out in a couple months. So I think just maintaining what you think is best for the client is obviously the, the best way to run it, in my opinion. I don't think taking on 200 people and just having them on a cookie cutter plan, like that's not, that's not coaching. Yeah. So that's interesting. So even like about seven months ago or so, you had your full-time job of 50 hours a week? Yeah, I had my full-time job until a month and a half ago. Wow. Um, it got to a point where I was uh, between me and you guys and the thousands of other people apparently that are this <laughs> podcast. Right, I was right. probably doing a bit more coaching work at my job. And I think I ran into a little bit of an... I don't want to say like an ethical issue, but it was a point where I was like, all right, well, I can make the jump now. I'm doing fine in my my YouTube business and I, I don't want to take away from the business that I was working in by not putting my fullest effort to it. So I just kind of had a heart to heart, honest talk with my boss and I was like, I got something else going on. I don't want to take more of your time. So it it worked out. It's cool. And obviously I get to do YouTube. So it's yeah, <laughs> it, it's a gift. Can I ask what, and I got to need another specific job, but like, you know, like what uh, generally, um, what like services you were involved in? Yeah, I managed a gym. So my okay. life is bodybuilding 24 seven. Okay. So even then it, there was still a decent, like pretty strong crossover. So yeah. So I had, I had to do my best to keep it a secret because I didn't want to have any, I never signed a non-compete, but I didn't want to have people from the gym come and work with me. And I, I was just dead silent about it and made sure nobody knew um, that I had a, a quote unquote competitor business going on, which at the end of the day, it's online trained people in Europe and California and wherever right, the right. US and whatnot versus a localized small town in my state. Sure, sure. Okay. But yeah, so it wasn't like you were on like 50 hours and like, you know, corporate banker or something, you know, it was no, like no, no. related. <laughs> Not quite. Yeah. And in Paris, how about you? Are you doing full-time now or are you still doing yeah, I'm, full, I'm full-time with all my sponsorships and just all my income streams that came as a result of my social media along with some some other things i'm like you know i'm full-time man so i'm happy to hear that glad that you're you're full-time as well that freedom's got to be got to feel pretty nice after putting in those 50 hour weeks yeah it's nice man it's uh it's something that's it's it's a grind too because it's you have your good days and you have your bad days like there's there's pros and cons to working a day job too where it's like it sucks and you don't want to do it and you're on someone else's schedule working more hours than you need to in most cases i'd say but at the same time there are those fluctuations where your income as a, a quote-unquote youtuber it's like all right, well, if your channel just happens to die because the algorithm isn't treating you well or because you didn't realize that your content is not good enough, it's like everything fluctuates so much more. But I think with uh, with that lifter's mindset that you just build over the years, it's one of those things that you can translate from the gym directly into day-to-day -day life like that if you choose to do it. So I'm choosing to yeah, just stay optimistic and understand that it's like a quote-unquote risk. But I think I can make it happen. You just have to stay patient and keep keep improving your content which is something that i'm i'm continuously trying to to do basically that's awesome i mean the risk with working for somebody is that they never pay you enough so okay like yeah. I work myself and pay me whatever i want to i still do a little personal training on the side um and to that point i set my prices pretty high i do less of that these days just because i i don't need to but i'll always have like that foundation of people that i could work with if i needed to that, yeah. that's for in person you mean yeah person to person yep yeah and having having multiple income streams it's honestly the way to go it's like just being diversified when you're by yourself uh kind of doing your own thing so yeah you've set yourself up nicely man i appreciate that thanks i think it's interesting though because for you guys both having like the in-person training that that is helpful because I, I do always wonder about people who, and not that it's a bad thing, I just wonder if they have a game plan. Because you guys are both late 20s, right? Is that right? I'm 24, so oh, kind okay, of so, yeah, 20s. So, I'm a kid. Um, so, so, you know, sometimes I, I hear people who will have like a really 
good job and like they you know they have all these benefits and everything and then they'll like go to youtube and i always just think you know like just i, I think it's great to take risks but i also sometimes wonder like you do you have something in in place if youtube isn't going to be what you do for 30 years i mean you know not a ton of people are just doing youtube for like i mean obviously youtube has only been around since i think like 08 or something like that but you know what i mean like you know like what is the long-term trajectory um but i also think with you guys having this background and in in-person training, it's helpful because like, let's just say, you know, for whatever reason, algorithm change, something happened with your channel, you do have this kind of backup of, Hey, I could always go to a gym and train. And it's so in line with what I've done. Right. Versus somebody who had a job that's like completely different than what they were doing. They quit it. And then mentally it would probably be very hard to then have to go back to that after completely removing yourself, you know? Yeah. I think, I think each person's situation is a bit different where it's like, if you're, take you Dave for example where you went to school and you have you work as a dentist so you have this job that has your benefits and pays well and you enjoy doing it versus someone like me where it's like I never went to school I had a job anybody can get it's like for me I'm not like oh I have 800 bucks a month in student loans and I'm just going to go be a YouTuber for my career and hope right. that pays better than a 401k would it's like I, I think you kind of have to assess the situation where for me it was like I don't want to say it was a lateral move, but it's like I was at a job where I don't want to say it's a dead end job, but kind of, and it's low risk. But I think if I was say a dentist and I went to school and I have this great job that pays me well, that I like doing that I went to school for, that's a completely different story. And maybe it's a better call just to say, I'll probably take on less clients, like you said, five to 10 and do YouTube as my little more of like a passion project. If that makes sense. So I think it's, I think it's all situational. I think totally. that to that point, it's it's important that if someone wanted to take a stab at wanting to do what we do or trying to get to that, that they make sure that they have that groundwork laid in some capacity. So not only like for me, I won't get into all of my business because it's my business, but I was in the military at one point and there's benefits between the VA loan and healthcare and all kinds of shit that I could fall back on, excuse my French, that I could fall back on if I needed to. I have experience in the financial field as well. Like there's a lot of things that I could do if like crap, the YouTube career didn't work out. I'm getting yeah. three views a video now that I could do if I needed to. So to anyone that would like to make content, don't like quit your job and then move to California and start a YouTube channel and then not have anything to fall back on because of reality can suck sometimes sure no totally and that, that's why i brought it up because i don't want people like i think it's awesome what you guys are doing and other people like that um but i don't want people to just yeah, there's there's something to be said for like you know the whole like um what is it like burn the boats and everything and just kind of like put everything into it which is great but a lot of times it doesn't work out and you do have to kind of be aware of, of what could happen. Um, and then obviously, yeah, like, like you said, Landon, in a situation like mine, where it was like, you know, very dedicated schooling and everything like that. Like there's, I don't have the interest or any like desire there to, to make coaching my full-time gig. And it's totally a passion project, which is really nice because it, it makes it so there's not this pressure to constantly churn out videos if I just don't want to um, constantly take on more clients if I don't want to, like I keep it where it's very enjoyable. Um, and I do wonder if there would be burnout, like, again, you guys are relatively young, relatively new to it in, in terms of like the doing it as your full-time career. Um, but I do wonder how many people burn out and then kind of transition. Like if you look at somebody like Omar Esau, right, it was like, uh, coaching people and then it was like content and then he switched to merchandise. And I would imagine that if he just kept doing like two YouTube videos a week, every week for 10 years, that could burn somebody out. And, you know, it's nice that within the fitness industry, you have a lot of different things you can do. You know, you mentioned sponsors, Paris, so you've got sponsorships, you've got training. Some people do the merchandise, some people have um, like apps that they create. So it's not like you're limited to just one thing, even if you stay within the fitness industry. Absolutely. You know, uh, opportunities multiply as they're seized. It's from Sun Tzu. It's a Chinese proverb. It basically means like the more that you can do, and do it well, the better benefits you're going to get from it. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Cool, cool. Uh, so, so let's get back to the programming a little bit there. So um, let's say you've got somebody who has responded to a particular variable, right? So, you know, you, you've increased their volume. You said, okay, like they, they continue to grow. 
Do you guys have a general guideline that is either applied for you or just specifically more to clients where you've tried certain variables and it doesn't work and then you hit it like a stall, what you would do next with somebody? Or is there a specific area you're looking at, whether it's exercise selection? Um, this is this is assuming that they've gotten like their sleep and, in, in, you know, handled and, um, you know, they're in a slight surplus, you know, we're not talking about somebody who's just like going out partying, like they've got that stuff handled. And just from a programming standpoint, things you do to get over certain blocks. Yeah. yeah so getting through blocks and plateaus is always an interesting one because it's always so situational and a lot of the time it comes down to whether you're training a someone that's more of a beginner or someone that's a little bit more advanced and i think with with the beginners it's usually you have to work with them to dial things up whether it's something as simple as consistency or effort or it's something like all right well their stimulus just isn't potent enough. So we have to add more volume or add frequency and just build their program up versus someone that's maybe a little bit more advanced. It could actually be like a recovery issue or they're just going too hard because they're obsessed with training. So at first, I think it's figuring out what's the larger issue going on here, assuming that like sleep and diet and everything are in check. And then from there, you just have to ask for the right questions, get a good idea of how their training is going and just nail down the form clips, nail down their, their progression. And that's where I start to reflect back on their program. If the, once they run into a plateau, how, how are these lifts doing? Were you progressing well before? And now it's, now things are slowing down, which is a good sign. You're probably not building muscle. So I think it's just almost like reverse engineering their training and getting an idea of, um, of what's working and what's not, and whether something used to work and now it's not working and just, you you have to go from there because every situation is a little bit different. I don't think there's any one piece of advice or one programming trick that can just solve anybody's plateau. How are you distinguishing? Um, and I'll get back to you in a sec, Paris. I just for Landon, how do you distinguish between if somebody is stalled? Because I think this is something a lot of people wonder. You know, again, diets in order, sleep is in order. They're just not progressing how you'd expect them to. How do you go about saying, okay, is this that there's too much going on and they're not recovering and we need to cut back versus they just don't have the stimulus and we need to add to it? So I think you can take a look at the general recommendations for volume and for intensity. And I think once you've once you've been lifting for a while and you've trained people and you've been in the space for a while, you can get an idea of if someone's if someone's well below 10, 10 or 12 sets a week, say they're at five, seven, eight sets per week and they're not growing, you can generally use that as a strong indicator that they're not doing enough. Uh, and then you can take the same thing for proximity to failure. Like if they're leaving reps in the tank on most lifts, they're probably not training hard enough. But if they're going, say, 15 to 20 sets a week and they're not progressing, they're probably not recovering or they're just not training hard enough because they're sandbagging. So whatever the issue is, I think you can generally get an idea of if they're doing too little or if they're doing too much. All right. Thoughts, Paris? That's a great point. Uh, auditing, you know, the, the measure of what they're doing, like is it, is it too much or too little? I'm a lot more in, instinctive in that regard and that I more so look at it's hard to even put in the words, honestly, but I look at the flow of their training and is momentum being built? And if momentum isn't being built, it's usually because, and I train a lot of people that are into powerlifting or strength relative to a one rep max. And oftentimes when they're not making progress, they'll, they'll be doing great with all their accessories. It's that strength training slot or the strength training slots where if they aren't making progress, it's usually because they're going too hard too soon. When you start off, and this is how I strength train. I don't know how you guys do it, but I start off with lower percentages and we're not really going to failure on anything until it's time to like PR or perform or do something more than we did last block. So if they're going to failure week one or week two, that'll make week three not as effective as it should be which will then affect week four and so on. So I really just keep a close eye on them and make sure that we're using a level of intensity that is appropriate on our strength training work so that next week we can do a little bit more. 
and so that we can do a little bit more and so on until we get to when it's, it's actually time to go to failure on our strike work. And to that point, it's a lot more about looking at their execution as well, because we can't also to that point look at it as just percentages and reps on paper. Five reps on a deadlift done with the type of form that is going to allow you to lift the most on a one rep max is a lot different from five reps with whatever soup sandwich form we're using to get the weight up. And if you stack up bad reps over time or you're getting sloppier and sloppier with your form, the strength adaptation is going to be different from that as well. So for me, I don't so much have to audit like the hypertrophy or whatever work capacity parts of their training. It's more so just making them accountable with holding back, if that makes sense, so that they can have good forward progression in that regard. You mentioned the blocks there. So, um, because before I, I don't, I didn't know if you were breaking it up into like mesocycles, excuse me. I didn't know if you were breaking up into mesocycles like that. And are you then kind of following like, you know, Renaissance periodization talks about this a lot and like revive stronger will they'll have maybe like a five or six week block, then they'll reset it. And the idea is just to try to beat the previous week of the previous block, right? So like week two of, of you know, block two should be week two of block one. Are you just focusing on progression in that sense rather than just like ongoing? Like how do you set up your blocks? So the way that I, I can just break down how I structured strength training on a high level. And I also like train people for hypertrophy, which is again, different. But for fellas that I'm training for strength, We'll have our strength work and then we'll have like our hypertrophy exercises and accessories for the strength work. We'll start somewhere around and we have to know what their training max is. We'll start around 60, 63% of the one rep max. I have them do like three or four sets and we're just going to rep it into like RP seven or like three reps, reps away from failure. And mm -hmm. we're pretty much maintaining that week by week, adding like three to 5%. Once we get to about 80%, we're adding uh, a top single so that they can start to practice singles. But we're, for the most part, not going to failure on any of these individual weeks or really even caring about how many reps we're doing. We're starting off with the lower percentages, really just building work capacity. That's how I like to look at it. I don't, I don't look at things as like hypertrophy block because I don't think in – a four week time period, unless you take steroids or something that you're not going to be able to build an appreciable amount of muscle. We're building work capacity that is then going to carry over to our medium and lower rep training later. So we'll go from a work capacity phase. Reps will naturally titrate down as our percentage gets higher. Medium reps, lower reps, and then eventually our singles. And then for hyper the hypertrophy aspect of that, Again, much the same as like a bodybuilding program, we're doing our double progressions, our dynamic double progressions when that's appropriate. The only difference is, is that we're in a bodybuilding program. We're looking to develop individual muscles to make them look a certain way or to grow them maximally. We're growing the muscles relative to the strength training lifts that we're trying to build. So for bench, that'd be triceps, shoulders, pecs. So for your strength training blocks, yeah, pretty much throughout the entire thing, you're keeping it pretty far from failure until you're trying to hit all time PRs. Is that right? Pretty much. I would say we get a little bit closer to failure as we get, as we approach, you know, when we're supposed to hit a PR. So maybe around 85% or so we'll go from doing like three reps away from failure to two reps away from failure. And then that will eventually turn to maybe one rep away from failure each set, but we're not, we're not going to failure at any point other than the time where it's actually time to perform and do a one rep max or a rep PR or whatever the case may be. And then for your bodybuilding programming, are you following individual blocks in the same way or is it just the double progression kind of long term? Somewhat of a mixture between the two, because to be quite honest with you, at least for the fellows that I work with, even if they have a hypertrophy minded goal, they also want to um, get an individual lift stronger. So someone, for example, I have a fellow that I work with, he's really, he has an emotional attachment to his bench press. I think we all do. He'll want to increase his bench press, but then also train for hypertrophy maximally and everything else as well. So we'll follow somewhat of a strength training progression for that. But then for everything else, it'll be, 
like to the to your point of double progression or a dynamic double progression and really just auditing form and then knowing when to change the exercises as well cool well yeah no it, it does seem like that's just the, kind of the general consensus that when it comes to hypertrophy it, you know there's a lot more forgiveness in terms of what works and and not that the programming doesn't matter um i do think it, it can matter but i just think that when it comes to strength training it does have to be a little bit more specific um and, and you know some of the research does show that you do want to stay a little bit away from failure when doing pure strength training one because from a, a technique standpoint right you don't want to train bad movement patterns but two it actually seems like just overall it seems to help strength progression um and Landon, are you doing pretty much any strength training for clients? Or, I mean, obviously, you named basement bodybuilding. Is it primarily bodybuilding and hypertrophy work? Yeah, it's mostly bodybuilding and hypertrophy work. I Every now and then, I'll get someone that maybe cares about the big three or wants to get a certain lift up. So I'll occasionally go towards more of like a strength-focused thing there so maybe it will be like a static rep range or something that's a little bit farther away from failure but generally in most cases hypertrophy is always the primary goal so we'll just train purely for hypertrophy and that's usually something like starting off with a double progression and milking that out for a while and nailing solid fundamentals down in terms of technique and effort levels proximity to failure etc and then from there uh, triple progression with the volume would typically be next, but that's not, I find that that's not always necessary as soon as a lot of people think it is. I think a lot of people can milk double progression for a, a really long time. Like for the most part, that's what I'm still doing too. And I'm getting closer to advanced than obviously beginner. So uh, yeah, it's generally double progression, hypertrophy focused. And a lot of it comes down to technique effort proximity to failure and that's that's the base and then from there we'll just slowly build up and adjust around with uh with volume intensity and and frequency of course sure sure yeah yeah the the whole aspect of the double versus triple progression and, and just i guess maybe we should clarify for people listening so uh, if you imagine you know you're doing 50 pound curls or three sets of 10 right and then you could go like you know, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 11, 10, 11, 11, you know, you could keep going up and then maybe once you get to like three by 12, then you could add weight, right? That's like a very basic kind of progression. Um, and, and then another argument after that could be, well, then you would add a set, right? If you've been stalled for a while, maybe you need more volume and then you add a set. Was that, you know, pretty much how you would define it, Landon? Yeah. So technically, yeah. So double progression, the way that I like to define it is just as simple as possible would be a single progression is progressing in, in one aspect of training. So if you're just doing, say, five by five, and you're only adding weight, you're not adding reps, you're not adding sets, that would be a single progression. And then something like a double progression would be going back and forth between adding two variables. And I think the most the simplest way to look at it is adding reps on a lift and keeping the sets the same. And then once you've hit a certain threshold with your reps, then you'll add weight. So an, a certain example of this would be, for my incline curls, once I hit eight reps on my first set, then I will increase weight and the reps will naturally come back down. So I increase reps, 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 add the weight, reps, 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 add the weight. So I'm progressing between two variables. If I find that I'm stalling out with two certain variables, like the reps and the weight, that's when I'll go into a triple progression, which is simply just adding in another version of a, a variable you can progress in. And typically that's going to be volume so that's when i'll add a set and if that gets me up to that certain goal then i'll go back and kind of start from scratch with my initial volume amounts and then go back to the initial rep range that i'm working in so that that's just a first hand example of that explanation yeah and if it wasn't sets i guess technically there are other ways I, those are the three that i think we all tend to think about um i suppose you you could have another progression in terms of like cutting rest times, which I don't, I don't generally advise, but technically like that would be, you know, a way to progress or, or like improving your form and things like that. Um, I, again, I, I think form should generally be constant in that it, it shouldn't get to the point that it's bad enough, right. That it needs a lot of focus on improving, um, you know, once you've been at it for a while. And again, I, I'm not big on uh, dropping rest times, but there are articles and, you know, once upon a time, people would talk about that of like, you know, trying like, escalating density training with, I don't know if you guys were around like the T nation days when that was talked about. Um, but, but like in theory, those are other ways to progress too. Yeah, I'd say so. So the way that I see it is 
volume sets and reps, um, not volume sets and reps, volume weight and reps are the three main variables that are best for like a double or triple progression for hypertrophy, in my opinion, at least, of course, it, everyone's a little bit different. So those are the big three that you can mess with. Uh, when it comes to progressing in technique or rest times or frequency, those are things that you can do. And they're also, they're good ways to fix an issue in my opinion. Like I think if you're, if your rest times are just getting way too long, you could just keep, you could try to keep your efforts and your performance in the gym, the same and progress in rest times just to fix your program. But I don't think that's a long-term solution or something you want to be like, all right, well, I'm benching 225 for 10 and I'm going to stick with this until I can only rest 30 seconds between each set. I don't think that's a reliable way to continually progress on, but I think if your rest times are creeping up, you can say that it is still progression and same with progressing in technique. I have, I have my clients do that regularly. If a lift isn't going well, or if they got too greedy with the progressions, I'll say, you know what, just forget about it. You can still log your reps, still log your weight and everything, but try and get better at your technique. Don't worry about the reps, focus on technique, proximity to failure, and then the reps will eventually come. Just don't worry about it for now. Cool. Any additional thoughts there, Paris, on methods of progression? So I have, I would say, some pretty similar but also unique thoughts on the whole progression thing, specifically pertaining to um, rest intervals. I'm a really big fan of employing cluster sets when, when applicable, specifically for hypertrophy. And the idea of that is getting in a certain amount of, like a lot of work, actually, in a short amount of time. Uh, that's one way that I like to employ density training. So for those that aren't familiar, essentially do like a, an AMRAP, like as many reps as you can with like a rope press down, for example, you rest a little bit, and then you're doing clusters of between three and five reps for up to seven minutes with like 10 second breaks in between those clusters. And you end up getting a lot of work in that way. With regards to timed rest intervals for like straight sets, I also like reducing the sets or not the sets, the rest periods for those sets, specifically with an advanced individual that we're, it's harder to just add a rep or add a set or add more weight. And we're kind of picking every fruit that we can to try to drive progression. It's not something that I would use for someone that's intermediate or new, just because you don't need to do that. And I only ever do that for smaller isolations, with mm -hmm. low absolute loads where it's just, it's just hard to add weight to it week to week or month to month. So like a rope push down, a curl, something like that. So I want to touch on both of those actually. So for the ones that's like a cluster, you would do an AMRAP and then are you counting 10 seconds? Are you just saying, Hey, you have a total of five minutes, get as many reps as you can in five minutes. Like how are you specifically going about that? I tell people to put on a song just because we can't, we're not reliable narrators with counting you know, rest times because 10 seconds could easily turn into 30. And people have, have said to me, well, I did your five minute cluster set method and it took 20 minutes. I'm like, dude, how did that happen? It's, it's a five minute cluster. You do it. So I just tell people to turn on a song that they like. You're pretty much just getting as many reps as you can until that song is over. And you pick like a, a song that's like five minutes long. So it could be like some heavy metal or whatever the case may be. And that also makes it fun for, for people. They've had a lot of fun with it for that reason because it's tied to something other than training, some tangential, you know, hobby like music, whatever their favorite band is or whatever. I really, really like that, but I don't have that as a, a, a commonplace staple in programming. It's really just like I said, if they have an isolation that's been really stubborn and hasn't been responding the best to more conventional progression, we'll throw that in there. And I've personally found that that's always done the trick in breaking a plateau with those smaller isolations. Interesting. So, I mean, I assume as it could be a different song each week. So this sounds like it's a little bit less standardized of like, a, this is the exact thing. This kind of sounds more like a, you know, like a, in like the old school bodybuilding days, they would throw out these like burnout sets at the end. Right. And like, they didn't necessarily count reps and they were just kind of add it at almost like an intensity technique it kind of sounds more like that than it is like a standard progression i do standardize it a bit and then i like ask people to like record the cluster set so that they can make sure that they do a little bit more the next time we do it and we only ever do it for two to four weeks at a time so it's not very long that they're doing it but gotcha. i do 
want to make sure that you know you're, you're either getting in more quality reps because they start to look a little sloppy towards sure the sure or you're adding more total reps overall and then uh for the ones that are more like you said the more straight sets you're still limiting the rest time progressions to isolated movements and so you would just have them count like let's say two minutes between sets one week and then like a minute and 55 seconds the next week something like that absolutely and we never go i would say any lower than 60 seconds like it's no 30 second rest interval stuff that we're doing it's it's typically we'll start at like a standard rest interval for isolation which is like 90 seconds to two minutes for me and then we'll maybe take between 15 and 30 seconds away from that weekly yeah. keeping load and reps the same and then going you know back up in rest period and then adding a little bit of weight and then invariably usually that'll allow them to you know progress and rate and weight and stay in their rep range yeah i always found rest times funny because so when i first got into this and you know i was like following body for life back in like high school and whatnot and you know, I was neurotic with the rest time. So if it was like 120 seconds rest, I think the average person would like finish the set, go over, and they'd either just think of what two minutes was, or even they'd hit their timer, but then two, like, you know, 120 seconds would go by, then they'd probably go back to the equipment and they'd, they'd get started. Whereas by the time you've done all that now, it's maybe three minutes, right? I would like finish the set, count the number of seconds, hit the stopwatch, and then plan for like my 10 to 15 seconds to get back into position. Like I was doing the exact time. And I was doing that on every single set, which I just don't think was that necessary or helpful. Um, and eventually I just stopped doing rest times at all, which obviously could get ridiculous if somebody's just taking forever. Um, and, and you also have to consider that, like, let's say you do two sets of bench press, 225 for 10, 225 for 10, right? And then, you know, you got 225 for 10, 225 for 12 whatever obviously these numbers don't make a lot of sense in that regard but um if that was just done for because you rested longer you might not have actually progressed at all right mm -hmm. I, but the way i see it is like if you're doing this long enough and you don't have again absurd rest times eventually slight increases in your rest time to get progression are going to be made up for like over a year of progressing and everything like if you went from 120 seconds to 135 seconds like that's just not going to make the difference uh of, to like cancel out any progression that was made so i don't personally focus on rest times um however i do do rest pause sets and so during that time i will because i don't i don't want it to get out of control and obviously the whole point of well not the whole point a point of rest pause sets is to uh be a little bit more efficient with your time right and i know for me because i do like to rest a while these workouts can get to like two hours long. So I kind of force myself to get faster if I do rest pause. Um, if you guys are familiar with DC training and like uh, Dante Trudell's dog crap training, uh, they would talk about 12 to 15 breaths, which is in reality, if you see these guys training, these like bigger guys, that, that can be close to a minute. So I just keep it at like 40 seconds, but I might do, you know, first, first set might be 15 reps, uh, wait 40 seconds, and it might be seven, wait 40 seconds, and it might be four. Um, and it's not that I find this is superior. The studies on this are kind of ambiguous. Like, you know, there's a few that show that it's superior, a few that show neutral. I don't know if I've seen any that show it's negative, but in any case, it's, uh, it's just something to kind of like keep it interesting and keep things faster. Um, but I generally try not to obsess too much on, on the rest times. What types of exercises do you use rest pause for typically, or is it just across the board? Um, I, I will do it with both compounds and isolations, but generally not anything that takes a lot of positioning, like, like a barbell bench press is a horrible exercise to do that for, right? Because like there's set up or even worse, a dumbbell bench press where you have so much energy going into kicking it up and everything. Uh, like <laughs> I think I tried out like a dumbbell shoulder press one time and, you know, I, I was lifting like some pretty heavy weights. I mean, not, you know, I guess heavy by the internet standards these days, but you know, like 90 to hundred pound dumbbells and you know, I'd kick them up and, you know, I might get like eight to 10 reps and then I'd rest 40 seconds and I try to kick it up and I wouldn't even get one because so much went into that initial, you know, like kicking up and everything. So I think those exercises, squats, um, deadlifts, I, I would not recommend those for rest pausing. Uh, I'm sure people can do it, but generally speaking, I would say isolation exercises or, um, things that are easier to get into position for like machines and things like that, huh? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do them and actually I do them for pull-ups at home. And when I do that, I will actually drop the weight. Um, so I'll do, what do I do? Like 90 pounds for eight and then I'll take the belt off and then I'll do body weight and I'll get like another eight and then I'll do body weight for like five or something like that. So, um, just because there are certain exercises that I just don't want to do a set of like 18 for my first set, you know, I just, it's just like less pleasant and I like keeping some heavier stuff in there. So, um, but general guidelines, yes, like machines and, and isolations are a little bit better for it. That's pretty much how I do it. I was just curious how you like to do it. Yeah. Landon, do you incorporate any sort of um, either drop sets, press pause, anything like that? Uh, length and partials or cheat reps past failure on sub lifts I do. So okay. uh, especially on calf raises, I've been absolutely destroying my calves. Uh, I do it a lot on table lateral raises too. I think especially for lifts that are short and biased. So where the tension is mostly placed in the shortened position, doing partials past failure or cheat reps are great. Um, and then for, for stubborn muscles too, something like a calf where it's just hard to generate that much force. I think the length and partials are nice because you can really just emphasize the stretch and training that length and position. As far as like rest pause or anything goes, I haven't been doing a whole ton of that for kind of a while at this point. I've just been purely focusing on straight sets and maximizing what I can get in one solid effort for most of my training. And I found that um, that works really well for me. But with that being said, I have been thinking about going back into some some other intensity techniques like a rest pause or something like that recently just to just to see how it goes. Because now I've been consistently progressing at a, a, a consistent rate for a while. So if I was to uh, incorporate like a rest pause, I'd be curious to see how that changes things, especially if everything else is generally the same, like my my bulk status, my surplus and my overall volume and frequency and stuff. Yeah, let me know how that goes if you do that. I'd be curious. I like I said, I generally don't think that they're superior. Um, and it's it's interesting actually. I brought this up with Dr. Mike because it's funny. If you look at the studies, they generally show that longer rest times are superior for hypertrophy, right? And then you look at the studies that compare, let's say, rest pause with straight sets, and they are either the same or sometimes rest pause will even win out. And it's like, okay, so the rest pause is going to have less rest obviously and generally speaking it's going to have less total volume load because since you're resting less time you're not going to be able to get as many reps on the subsequent sets right and you know maybe the studies are just too short who knows i mean it's not like these are like very well powered studies but you would think because of net lower volume potentially and less rest that they would perform worse overall but they, they don't seem to um, but for me it's just a time thing like i really like that i can just kind of be done with it because i I do tend to kind of drag on with my straight sets, admittedly. Yeah, I, I can fall into that habit too, especially at the home gym where it's not like you, you, you don't feel like you're hogging up a machine or anything. My workouts yeah. slowly creep up towards that longer than they need to range. But one thing I'd be curious to see is either a long-term study or just to experiment with myself or something. Uh, if how much you can adapt to like a rest pause. So if you were to count, say, a rest pause where you do one straight set to whatever given proximity to failure, like say zero reps in reserve. And then if you were to do two mini rest pause sets after that, like, could you get yourself to a point where you can train yourself to handle that on a regular basis, counting each rest pause. So let's say you do a straight set with two mini sets after as the rest pause, but counting that in terms of your weekly volume is just one set. Like, could you get yourself to be able to treat the, to treat that like one normal set because with the recent uh analysis that came out on the importance of proximity to failure i'd be curious it's like would that be a uh, farther into failure than just taking it to failure in a straight set and if we can get ourselves to be able to adapt and handle that kind of intensity on a regular basis and then even work our volume up in that like how how much could we push that and that's the one thing that i'm always kind of curious about because i think a lot of that stuff is studied short term or maybe we bite off more than we can chew in our training so we say all right well i'm, I'm not going to do that for very long um just go back to regular training soon like how how could we possibly manage to handle that on a regular basis and maybe progress in that if that makes sense 
Yeah, yeah, it would be interesting to see. I, I often wonder, though, how much just because you can adapt to doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be any better at results. And, and I don't know if you guys have found this as well, but for me, and, and Abel and I have talked about this, there seems to be a very wide range of sets and, and just work that the human body can adapt to and not necessarily make better progress. So like for me, you know, I can recover from 30 sets a week per body part, depending on the body part. Like I'll still be fine. I'm not going to lose muscle and I may even gain, you know I mean? At this point, it's hard for me to gain really anything. But like, you know, if I look at even like my intermediate period, there were times where I had 20, 25 sets and other times I had like four to five and the progression was kind of similar. And so it does seem like for a lot of people, there's a level that you can adapt to but it's not necessarily going to change the progression. Like, uh, like instead of it, just, like, I think in theory, you could imagine it like, you know, more and more sets, you hit this perfect number of sets and then any more than that impairs recovery. And then it starts to go down. And, and like, in theory, I could see that in my experience, it's like, okay, this is where you get the growth. And then like, you know, you call this like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, whatever, how many sets. And then at some point, eventually it'll go down, but there's a pretty wide range. Is that uh, you know, reflect your experiences or, or not so much? Um, I think it's something that I have to experiment with more. It's just like, I guess I'd be curious to know what are the possible methods where I can get as much stimulus as I need to from a session? Like would like two or three super hard sets to failure and beyond get me that same stimulus as six sets in a session that goes to zero RIR? And I'm curious to know if you can make up lost intensity with a little bit more volume or if there's ever, or it's like, if there's a certain threshold you can hit that there's just no way you can get beyond that and recover properly. It's, it's one of those things that I think is a little bit different for everybody. So I'm, I'm curious to, I guess, see more about that in the science. I'm not a huge sciencey guy, but I'd be, I'd be curious to see more studies on that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and maybe even like, I, I would maybe talk to Abel about it, because I know he's had some ridiculous, I mean, I've gone up there with volume, but I think at one point, he was trying like 60 sets a week for back to see how he was doing and everything. Um, so he might be interesting to talk to for you. Yeah. Any thoughts on that, Paris? I'm uh, with a lot of things with training, very instinctive. So to the to the volume point, again, it's more so about less how much can I do and how much can I adapt to do just to do so but is what I'm doing allowing me to progress and if not adapting to more so that I can progress and not necessarily just doing more just to do more to see if that will make me grow if that makes sense sure so have you not then pushed things high volume wise just because you haven't felt the need to do it oh my volume is pretty high right now for certain things that's just more so as a result of needing to do that, I found mm, okay. like incrementally over time, I've just naturally done more volume when I needed to, to progress. And that's more so where I'm at with it. I remember actually distinctly in our last conversation saying, well, I hate high volume. I could never do that. I ended up needing to, to continue to grow. So yeah, yeah. That's funny. That's Cause that so was, I, I mean, that was what, maybe a year ago or so that we year, spoke here and change ago. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Wow. Uh, so, so what happened? You just noticed like, Hey, the progress just isn't happening as I expected. So I just have to ramp up. So I'm someone where if, if something isn't working in my own training, I can kind of identify that qu quicker than someone else may be able to. Just, it's just something that I've been able to do in my mm -hmm. training. So I've never just not made progress for an extended period of time. It's like, well, this wasn't working the way it was last month. Let's just try and do a little bit more or refine this and then just incrementally turning dials whenever I need to, like I said, to get to where I'm at now. It's never been like I've been stumped as to why I'm not making progress. I can look at it gotcha. objectively and say like, I need to do more of this. I'm not doing this at all, which kind of, it, it all comes full circle because that's why I, chose to do full body because it allowed me to do everything that I wanted to have the high exercise selection, pick exercises that have the best stimulus to fatigue ratio, because you can't just do big barbell movements all the time on a full body workout. You'll 
you're not able to do that, especially not at the volumes or frequencies that I'm doing it. Like, for example, I'm training my arms pretty often because mm -hmm. I want to bring up my arms and I'm training my legs pretty often too. I have 27 inch thighs right now. And I certainly would not be able to get in the volumes that I'm doing now if I were to just barbell back squat, because one, I'm strong. Two, I'm not necessarily built for squats. I'm very hip dominant. So that'd be a lot of lower back fatigue. So that forced me to pick exercises that give me a good bang for my buck. So like deep leg presses, leg extensions, hack squats, heel elevated squats where I can stay more upright. Just to say that I'm very instinctual with a lot of things. And I do things because I feel I need to, not because, well, I'm going to try this and just see how it works. Sure. Yeah. You said you have 27 inch thighs right now. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of that just because I read my comments and in the past when I was especially leaner at the end of my cut a couple of years ago, when I was around 170, like really lean, my legs were not as big as I would have wanted them to be. So yeah. I'm really proud of that. That's great, man. Cause you're, what's your weight and height now? I'm a buck 98 right now. I'm five foot 11. Oh, damn. Okay. So yeah, you're heavier than I realized. I, I thought you were in like, like the 180s. So yeah, 1898. Remind me, Landon, you're also about 5'11"? I'm 5'9". Five 5'9". Nine. Five nine. I look okay. taller because I have a short power rack behind me. Okay. <laughs> um, and you're maybe in like the 180s or so? Yeah, like I fluctuate around, yeah, 185, 186. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. And how big are your thighs, bro? Um, I haven't measured in a few months. Last time I checked... 25 and change i want to say 25 and a half yeah i think I'm at. so not not bad but not great um i actually i don't know if you've been if you saw my video a couple months ago i got i got called out for having chicken legs so really? i uh, <laughs> had to um, um take the leg training a bit more seriously now so i'm uh sorry. first lift i did with my new membership at the gym is uh some hack squats okay so, yeah um yeah no it's funny it's, it's tough with measuring thighs because I, I assume these measurements you guys are talking about are at the the widest part of the thigh mm -hmm. and, and so like for me you know like i i have a friend jimmy who looks like he's got these like super meaty legs and he does but we'll measure and a lot of times my measurements just don't make sense to me because like we'll have we have the exact same measurements and you look at his legs and he's like thick meaty legs and mine just don't look that big um, I have another friend, uh, Jason, who at one point, mine were 27 inches, his were 25, but we would stand next to each other in the mirror and, you know, better insertions on him. He was five, nine. They just looked much bigger. And so I think measurements within an in individual are very important. I know some people say, oh, it doesn't matter what your measurements are when you're on stage. It's like, sure. But most people aren't on stage, right? The reality is like, you know, if somebody has 18 inch arms, you don't need to know anything else about them. If they're not fat and they have 18 inch arms they have big arms, right? Like I do think measurements matter, um, but mostly for an individual because the shape and the insertions can be so variable. But with thighs in particular, it's not like like biceps, like you measure the peak and it's it's generally pretty consistent. Like thighs, you know, depending on, you can go up or down an inch on the thigh and it could change quite a bit what the actual measurement yep. is. Um, but I, I try to do what I can to keep it consistent. I would say at the middle, they're like 25, but then at the biggest point, they're at like, they're always like 26 and a half to 27 at, at my current body weight, which is about 195. Um, I had to go back and see when I was like 220, but that was, that was a pretty soft <laughs> 220. So it, you know, and, and obviously, you know, plenty of fat is carried in the thighs too. Right. So, uh, you know, you could have a very inflated measurement depending on your, your body fat. Yeah. I think the secret for, if you, if you just want a big measurement on your thigh, just get massive adductors like your thighs people don't when you compare like limb measurements i think if you go to arms obviously your your joint so your elbow and your shoulder that's where the the tendons are so it tapers up towards the middle where it's like your measurement for your arm is it's black and white it's like if you have an 18 inch arm you know the 18 inches is somewhere in the center of course the insertions are slightly different or the muscle bellies if you want to get more specific but sure. When it comes to thighs, it's like some guys just have like the sausage thigh where the whole thing is just meaty, especially towards the knee. Yep. And those guys generally tend to like look, they have more impressive thighs. Like when you have just like a pair of shorts on, you can see the teardrop and you're like, holy shit, this guy's yep. jacked. But then it's like 
somebody, even like myself, where my quads are my biggest weak spot, I have these giant adductors. So my measurements can probably mug someone else that genu genuinely has bigger legs than I do for the most part, just besides maybe the adductors. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot that goes into it. And like, oh, go ahead. Sorry. So I was, yeah, I was just going to say, like, it does have a lot to go into, like, uh, proportions. Like, I know Lane Norton has talked about, um, for him, part of it was that he, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, he, he built up an incredible squat, and he got his legs up quite a lot. Um, but I think relative to his height, and that's what it is. It's a lot of times, it's not just the, the net size, but, like, relative to your height and proportions. Uh, I was trying to find this picture because, um, you know, my legs are definitely just look thinner but so this is a picture if you guys can see it's not going to focus that well so i'm i'm like the where it's okay i'm like the skinnier one here right so i'm six one uh very long limbs and at this time i mean you'd have to be looking at youtube video to see this but this is my cousin who um i made this post over a year ago and he's 17 years old where this kid gets his genetics i have no idea just like these tree trunk legs um you know barely trained just you know like pretty gifted there and at the time of that picture, I had squatted four or five for reps. My legs were about 20, probably about the same 26 and a half inches. But, um, you know, there, there's so much, like you said, I think the adductor is a big thing. Um, if, if you get that like teardrop muscle, that's a big thing. And a given measurement, especially for something as big as quote unquote legs, it can, it can really be hugely variable, you know, in how it looks. Absolutely. I have those quad insertions where, um, I have to pretty much wear like the like the, the Daisy Duke type of shorts for you to really see them because like my yeah. quad inversions are really high. So that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm so, the same one, unfortunately. I wish I wish I had those massive teardrops. <laughs> yeah, there was some guy who uh you guys might have seen him. He's like this enhanced guy. Um he was featured on like Derek's channel. He just brought up and he kind of had like the swimmer build and he's like openly, you know, openly on gear and everything, but like massive transformation. And he had some TikTok S video and he was like in shorts and, you know, it starts off with him saying like, Oh, everybody says I have chicken legs. And then he pulls up his shorts and it's like, you know, Oh, and like looks at these huge legs. And I was like, man, this is like definitely the most humble brag I've ever seen because nobody is going to tell you that you have skinny legs. Like even it was exactly like what Landon described, even with shorts, you could just see this guy had huge legs, but um, you know, it's kind of like the, uh, the women who will take like a really good picture of themselves, quote unquote, without makeup and be like, oh God, so ugly without this makeup. And like, yeah, you, you know, exactly what you're posting. Right. So, <laughs> um, just curious, Paris, what did you do to get them up to 27 inches? So you mentioned that was something you're proud of other than just the weight gain. So definitely like making sure that I'm in a calorie surplus, like you said, to support my training a lot less barbell back squatting. Because for me, hmm. I can make it a quad exercise, but to push it to the to failure, it's like a the proximity to failure. My form would always break down. Making it more of a back exercise, even when the first three or so reps would be more quad bias. So I started doing a lot more leg machines, uh, leg extensions, deep leg presses, okay. deep back squats, heel elevated squats. Sometimes started doing those again recently after my leg presses, just to get in some more volume. But really just doing that. And what I really like about the leg machines is that they're low skill. So I don't have to worry about my form breaking down. And I know that every rep is targeting stimulus directly to like my quads and my adductors. And I also did the adductor machine a lot and hamstring curls all the time. Um, and stiff legged deadlifts. Those, those are like my bread and butter. Nice. Um any you you mentioned landed on terms of uh having like the adductors and, and kind of like how you're built anything that you've had to do in this recent uh shaming your legs period where people have mentioned stuff in order to bring yours up you mentioned the hack squats at the gym yeah uh so adding it a secondary lift so i think it's just before i was trying to get away with six total sets a week for quads so i would do i've kind of rotated between like a plat style barbell back squat with a Smith machine hack squat, just doing three sets of those twice a week. It's just not enough. And I have to be like, to get my quads up, it's, it's so hard. Um, I have to be so precise. Like if I squat, it's, it's all hips, it's all glutes, it's all back. Mm -hmm. and it's, I think you can see that in my development too. 
big glutes, pretty big lower back and spinal erectors, especially when I was powerlifting. Uh, and that's just how I know how dominant they are over my quads. So it's like, even if for someone like myself, even if I try and do a, a plat style squat, like my hips still find a way to take over. So that's mm. why I love something like a hack squat where it's the same position, but the, the machine forces, it really truly forces me to keep my hips under the bar because you can't push, uh, 2000 pound hack squat machine back, uh, back pad backwards. So, uh, that sure. keeps me honest, Smith machine hack squats, even with those, like my hips still try and cheat, but it's manageable for myself to keep my hips under the bar. So it's just, I, I feel like a beginner. I'm just starting from scratch and, and truly isolating my quads, which is something that I, I guess I didn't do enough of in the past before I understood biomechanics and how my own personal leverages work. So hack squats, yeah. um, even leg presses that involve a bit of the hips too. Those are kind of the sweet spots for me. Nice, man. Cool. Cool. All right, guys. Well, going on about a little over an hour and a half here. I thank you for taking the time to discuss programming with me. Um, you know, you mentioned that you're both full-time coaches now. So where can people find more of your stuff? Uh, Bald Omni Man on Instagram and YouTube. And then basement bodybuilding on youtube uh basement dot bodybuilding on instagram not so much uh fun stuff on ig so i'd say stick to the youtube channel All right awesome guys thanks again